Welcome to The Logo Fit Show. I'm your host, Lauren Conlon. Each week, we bring you the best insights in nutrition, mental health, habit building, training, and more. This week, I'm joined by Rick, our mental health counselor, to talk about body dysmorphia. Enjoy the show. All right, body dysmorphia. So this is actually a topic that you brought up to me. You were like, hey, is there, do we have a podcast on this already? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because I think you wanted to send it to somebody or reference it in some way. And I was like, actually, I mean, we've talked mm-hmm. about it, through it, but not necessarily a full podcast as far as like, let's define it, how to work through it, and just explaining this. And it's something that is so pervasive. I mean, mm-hmm. especially if we're talking about um, you know the fitness industry and especially especially when talking about people who have competed in the past in physique competitions or um, are currently competing right there, there's just any time you've done something even not just that but just at a high level mm-hmm. of you know your physique was somewhere or say you're a top level athlete mm-hmm. right which is not necessarily sometimes your body looked a certain way but sometimes it was just say I don't know, it was just different so anyways there is a lot of ways that this could influence Mm -hmm. people and I think that it's really important that we actually do have a podcast on this because um, we we actually didn't I was like Mm. how have we like just completely dodged this yeah I was a little I was surprised that we had for 200 plus episodes uh, we haven't covered that I know it's like I'd be talking about a lot of stuff but not not this apparently (laughs) so body dysmorphia let's define it Um, well first question though is this something that you see really commonly with clients Yes. Um, specifically clients with, you know, who are in the bodybuilding. And when I say bodybuilding, I mean the whole spectrum, right? Everything from bikini yeah. to bodybuilder through natural to not natural, whatever the term is. And it also applies, like this isn't just specific to the bodybuilding and health and fitness. Like body dysmorphia exists outside of that world. A lot of times people will start to focus or hyper-focus on parts of their body that don't that they don't feel match, you know, like they'll be like, I have too big ears or my nose doesn't fit my face or my jawline is too small or I'm too fat or I'm too skinny, right? And so like, it manifests a lot of different ways and people start to take some pretty extreme measures to address some of these things. Like they'll go through expensive and unnecessary plastic surgery. They start going down, like, they go down the rabbit hole pretty far, but when I start to read through like the definition, this is what, what I think is so important about this for your particular clients and the clients that you work with is like, it is the bodybuilding industry, Mm -hmm. right? To a large degree. So when I start getting into what are some of the things like, this is exactly what you guys are taught to do. And so like, if you didn't have body dysmorphia before this sport can actually help create it because of the ways, like what the criteria is that we look at for, for diagnosing it and treating it and what you guys need to do in order to like be competitive in this field. So let me kind of get into some of that. So what is body dysmorphia or BDD, body dysmorphia disorder? Um, So it's basically a preoccupation with one or more perceived defects or flaws in a physical appearance that are not observable or appear slight to others, right? So when we think about that, like in your a bikini competitor or bikini pro like I can look at the top like five women on that stage like and I'm a novice when it comes to this like I've known you for what two years Mm -hmm. basically so like I'm really new to the whole bodybuilding world I'll look at all five of them and be like yeah they're all phenomenal I can't tell the difference between any of them but you'll look at them and you'll be like no there's this this and this is this is different on her this is what's great on her she's got this these lines these things and I'm like you're explaining it to me and I still don't see that, right? So do you see how like in the bodybuilding world that is really like putting the body under a complete microscope where it's not even like, it's a completely different category to me working with the fitness and bodybuilding industry than it is like the general population who are just struggling with body dysmorphia. Yeah, I would say that there's a lot of general body dysmorphia, which I'm glad that you touched on with like plastic surgery or like, mm-hmm. oh, this jawline or look at this photo. And of course, I'm sure that social media and even like reality TV, like, I don't know, like people like, like the Kardashians, right? Like mm-hmm. something like that has certainly probably increased the amount of people who are like, oh my gosh, I don't have this or mm-hmm. whatever. It, it, and it's not their fault, right? It's, it's not, it's not social media's fault. It's not the Kardashians' fault. It's just like, it's in your face a lot. So people are starting to see it more. And then they're like, oh, I don't have this. So like, I'm lesser than Mm -hmm. um 
so it's very it can be very very general down to like you know oh i don't like my nose or it can be as much as like i am literally being judged mm -hmm. on what my glute shape size insertion leanness all of this looks like mm -hmm. against somebody else <clears throat> and it is the nature of the sport mm -hmm. there is literally no other way to judge a bodybuilding show without doing that correct um <clears throat> so it's not to say that there's anything wrong with it but part of understanding this i think is recognizing what you are getting into right and i think that the biggest thing that i've learned as a competitor and as a coach for all of these years is a lot of people are not prepared for that mm -hmm. um and this is something that I was not necessarily prepared for when I started. Um, mm -hmm. It's not necessarily something that I prepared my clients for mm -hmm. when they first started, right? And, um, you know, I kind of feel bad about that now, but that's what, you know, learning and more experience does. And, you know, if somebody's competed before, they, they get it. If you've even competed once, you understand. But for the first time competitor, I think it's really important to explain, like, listen, mm -hmm. you, this, is, this is what's going to be happening. And it's really hard to not take that, like, personally when mm -hmm. you maybe don't place well because right. then it's like oh well i didn't place well so that must mean that i'm not good enough mm -hmm. and that's just sometimes that's the reality sometimes you weren't as good as the other person mm -hmm. you know what i mean uh, but that doesn't mean that you as an individual are not good but it's really hard when those lines are blurred um of like placing based on what you physically look like mm -hmm. and then because of the level of leanness that competitors are at for 95% of people, they're not really in the most balanced headspace, let's just say that way, you know what I mean? Like you're very volatile, you're very um, emotional because your body is pretty much running on empty, right? Mm -hmm. And obviously, the more that you do this, the better that it gets, but also not always. For some people who compete more and more and more, they develop a better understanding and a deeper awareness and they can be detached from that. Mm -hmm. um, but for some people, I mean, we can define kind of how this happens. Like some people, it makes it much worse. Yes. It can take what you're already experiencing and amplify it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'll see and I'm going to get into some of the more specifics. We're going to get into like what your motivation is and the actual purpose of you competing. What is really behind you competing? But um, what I what I tend to see is, especially with bodybuilding, is people already struggling with depression or anxiety, mm -hmm. right? So if I'm a teenager and I'm struggling with depression, I'm struggling with anxiety. I find bodybuilding, right? Or any sport, insert sport right here. Um, and so suddenly it becomes an outlet for the anxiety, right? So, but if you're playing basketball or if you're playing volleyball or softball, it's not as focused on your physical appearance, right? Bodybuilding is focused on your physical appearance. So on one hand, right, I have a person who already is struggling with anxiety. So they find bodybuilding as a coping mechanism for their, for their anxiety. It provides an outlet for it, right? But then they get to a space where they want to compete, okay? And then... The anxiety gets worse because as the person starts dieting down for their show, they start to see the way that their body is changing. Not only the way that it changed while they were starting the bodybuilding process and gaining muscle and size and everything else that comes with it, but then what happens is, is they shrink down to these really unhealthy levels of body fat and they love the way that they look, but they hate the way that they feel. And what happens is, is they get used to seeing like, okay, this was the fruits of my labor. I worked my way all the way down to this and it's such an unmanageable state and it took so long to get there that the anxiety comes back even stronger when they start within two or three weeks like everything that they worked for that they spent months preparing for is gone like they can't see their abs all the lines are gone they're not vascular anymore and so like depression starts to set it and the anxiety that they were feeling before that bodybuilding was a coping mechanism for can actually become a trigger for it because now it's just this interplay between when's my next show so that i can feel better by looking better. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. I think that clarifies for a lot of people why they get into that cycle. Like I said, mm -hmm. there's some people who it gets better, right? The more shows they do, <clears throat> the more that they're, you know, focused on the internal and the mm -hmm. intrinsic goals and just getting better year after year and all of that. But for a lot of people, and this is kind of, I just don't always have the words to like describe it like you do, but they get sucked into this thing mm -hmm. right and it becomes the like oh, I did this show now I gotta do another one and another one mm -hmm. and another one and they're not ever fulfilled because it doesn't matter what show 
they win or lose or how they place or what they look like it's never enough and it just becomes this like cycle mm -hmm. um, and then you see people unfortunately lose everything else around them mm -hmm. or really their kind of sense of what else is around them and they put everything into this yes and this thing if you don't have a, a, like a solid foundation mm -hmm. is ever going to give back to you what you're actually searching for correct and that's the important part what am i getting back from it right so here's something i want to talk about so another di uh, criteria for the disorder is at some point during the course of this disorder the individual has performed repetitive behaviors such as mirror checking excessive grooming skin picking reassurance seeking right um as well as or the mental acts of comparing his or her appearance with that of others right did i just describe bodybuilding or did i just describe body dysmorphia okay as i said to you we've known each other for a couple of years right and so over the time i started like i'll subscribe or follow somebody on instagram who's like a pro bodybuilder right whether they're bikini or fitness or wellness or whatever like everybody does this. I mean, you watch people post videos of them working out in the gym. They'll post pictures of themselves posing in the gym. They'll post they're, every time I, I watch people, I go to a gym now, right? So I have a trainer. So I'll watch people. Rick's like, getting yoked, everybody. Yeah, right? I'm trying to, um, but no shows for me. <laughs> but I'll watch people in between my sets. They'll they'll pick up the weights. They'll do a set. They'll put the weights down, and they will immediately walk over to the mirror and like you know, check out their shoulder or their bicep or their tricep or they'll, you know, pull their pants up and start flexing their quad. And I get that some of that might be practicing the posing, they want to see the pump, whatever it is, but like the excessive mirror checking, the grooming, the skin picking, like the constant seeking of reassurance, right? I see a lot of this as this is where social media plays a huge role. I want the validation for my hard work. So I might post a video, which I might have however many thousands of followers, and the idea of it is like, I'm saying to myself, well, I'm going to post this because I want to inspire people and show them and this is what's great. So I can justify it with that action. But sometimes what I'm really hiding from myself is I'm looking for the comments. I'm looking for the fire emojis and people being like, oh my God, you're doing great. Like, that's the reassurance that comes from it. What's wrong with my fire emoji? Why are you laughing? I just love that you picked up on that and that's the most like you comment ever to just be like, it's fire. <laughs> Please just put fire emojis on every every competitor's post that you see from now on. I will. Bella for your, Bella for, you're just fueling it. Fire. You're like you're like future client <laughs> fire emoji. <laughs> but that's really how Rick gets his clients. I'm totally kidding. Totally <laughs> kidding. He's very ethical. I'm just being a shithead. But um, <laughs> the mental act of comparing yourself to other people, like literally being on stage, is judges who are supposed to be objective, right, and unbiased, and not have any relationship with the competitors, but their job is to compare you to the other people and you are comparing yourself to them. At least with other sports, whatever the sport is, jujitsu, basketball, softball, I can go out on the mat and compete against somebody and be like, they were better at jujitsu, right? Mm -hmm. There's something different about being on stage and being like, well, this person was just better looking than me. Mm -hmm. This person has a better body than me. There's a different mental toll that that takes. And when you're constantly comparing yourself to other people, which that's what this sport is, it is comparing yourself to other people. You can't get around this aspect of it. And so this is why I say it kind of feeds into this disorder. So if you don't have a strong, not just a strong mindset, because there's plenty of people who have strong mindsets in this sport, you have to be in order to be successful. You have to know how to push through pain and have high tolerances and be so committed to the dieting aspect of it. like. That's the most insane part. Like what you guys do in the gym, that's one thing. The dieting part, that's the real mental like anguish that comes with the sport, I think, in my opinion. But um, all of these things, like if you can listen to those two definitions, those two basic definitions of what it is, it's like it completely relates to the sport. And in fact, the sport can actually create aspects of this disorder. And even just outside of physique competitors, which I know we're <clears throat> making a lot of the focus of this podcast towards that because it is so prevalent. Um, but I saw people who are listening who maybe aren't doing physique sports to, to take stuff away from this too. The mirror checking is something that I notice a lot of people struggle with. This is irregardless of being a competitor or not. Um, and it's something that I, I don't know, I don't really do. 
mm-hmm. right? And like sometimes, not sometimes, a lot of times things that we don't personally deal with, we can sometimes struggle to understand why would somebody else mm-hmm. be doing that, right? Just just don't look in the mirror. Um, <clears throat> but when I, and I hear this pattern and this trend from clients who have this kind of obsessive almost tendency to, you know, mirror check all the time, there is nothing positive that's really coming out of it. Now, do I look in mirrors? Like, obviously, you know what I mean? Um, but I am not walking by every mirror during the day to, to see how I look um, at all. Even sometimes when I get dressed, I'm just kind of like, oh, I'll put this on. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't even really look. I just kind of, right, like, again, I'm looking in the mirror if I'm washing my face or I'm putting on makeup. Like, of course I'm looking, but I'm, it's a very different way of looking mm-hmm. than, you know, when I used to when I was competing or, or whatever. And even now, sometimes if I'm like, oh, let me just take a picture, and I might take a few that I like don't like, and I'm like, just not feeling this day, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna sit here for 30 minutes and try and hit something, whereas like maybe before I would have, right? Or I know a lot of people will struggle when they go to like the mall, right? And they're mm-hmm. like, oh my gosh, I, you know, didn't look in this today, that whatever. And I always find those clients will go on their like worst body image day. They're like, oh my god, I was so bloated. I have my period. It was an awful week. I didn't I to go to the mall and try and bathing suits. I'm like, bro, do you want to have a mental breakdown? Like, do you just want to feel shitty? Which actually could actually be the real reason. But, like, you are making this worse. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So if you have been somebody who struggled with body dysmorphia, just this constant mirror checking, and this does not mean that you don't ever look in the mirror again. I'm not suggesting that because sometimes mm-hmm. we need to be looking in the mirror to make sure, you know, we're put together. But there's a very big difference of looking in that way to, like, I'm looking to pick myself apart or, like, I'm just looking to make sure that stuff it goes together, mm-hmm. these colors work, and right. okay, now I move on. Like, I looked, okay, good to go, mm-hmm. I'm out of here. Um, but that's something I find that so many people are plagued with, and I just always see a really, really just, it, there's never a positive. It's always negative when mm-hmm. people are obsessively checking, and I know we're going to touch on it later, but there is some kind of component of, you know, obsessive Correct. compulsions here mm-hmm. that do feed into people who are more susceptible to body dysmorphia which makes a ton of sense because mm-hmm. it's just like this repetitive yeah. thing and it just becomes this loop in your mind and so some people might be asking the question like all right if i have these things or i notice that i'm doing these things how do i know when it's within a healthy range and when it's not well i'm going to go back to my favorite phrase that you guys have all heard time and time again which is, is this causing clinically significant impairment in the following areas, like social, occupational, or other areas of function, right? If it's interfering with you, and I'm not just talking about like mirror checking, but like, yes. you know, if you're so preoccupied with what your body looks like, that it's impacting what you're eating and your ability to function at work, and it's, or you're spending excessive hours at the gym and it's impacting your relationships and it's impacting your ability to um, socialize with people outside of the gym where you can't do anything and you start limiting um, your interactions with people or going places or you won't go certain places Mm -hmm. because you can't control your diet or you can't look the way that you want to look or you know these are issues where it's like okay this is the impact of the function that we're talking about no don't get me wrong anybody who I think is getting into working out is going to naturally start to do some of these things I have found myself like okay at the end of a workout, like my trainer was actually was like joking with me about it. She's like, "Do you find yourself flexing more?" I'm like, "Oh, right after a workout, like that's <laughs> I like I want to see fire some emoji. benefit of what I'm doing." Yeah, fire emoji. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> By myself, I'm just gonna. <laughs> I'm I'm commenting. I'm just I'm yeah, yeah. comment that. So. <laughs> I think that some of that stuff, there, there can be things where it's done in normal ranges and so yes. I'll hear a lot of times where people are starting to lift or they're working out, you know, and they're just checking themselves in the mirror a little bit. They want to see the lines, they yes, want to see if things are growing. That's relatively normal because it's not impacting the function. If you're going out, if you're doing things, if you're able to work, if you're able to maintain your relationships, it's when these things bleed into those areas and start to impact them that that's when the disorder really starts to exist and we can measure it. We can say, okay, how is this impacting you? And we have some criteria to measure that against. And then we also have a way to start addressing it. Yeah. The mirror checking example that I went more into is mostly because that's when it's reached this level of like Mm -hmm. almost obsession, right? Or um, it's become really, really negative. Of course, like looking in the mirror is normal, especially if you're at the gym where you're you know, you are making progress and you want to see, mm-hmm. you know, what's changing. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And I think that there, this is such a, 
like so many things we talk about, there's always like this, there's like that very, very fine line of like, when is it normal? Um, and when is it like become mm -hmm. a problem? Yeah. And a lot of these things are not problems, right? Like you, you care, like you take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Like you want to make sure that you look good. You want to like, these are all very normal things. And like mm -hmm. a lot of people immediately when they see anybody who like works out, competes, has a good body, whatever it is, they're like, oh, they're just so narcissistic. They, all they care about is how they look and this and that. And it's like, no, that's not true at all. Like some of the right. most like selfless, caring individuals I know do this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That has no bearing just because of what they look like. Like you're simply judging them based on what they look like, right. which is completely incorrect. However, that doesn't mean that there's not certain people who of course do all those things and have all these negative tendencies mm -hmm. and have these negative tendencies towards themselves as well. So it's mostly like, it's not that saying, training and taking care of yourself and wanting to look good and checking out that you look good and celebrating mm -hmm. that. There's nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean? To like know, okay, wow, like I've put in this work, like I look damn good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But there is a level of where that line becomes, like you said, are you, are you not going to the pool because you like can't even fathom to like put on a bathing suit, mm -hmm. right? Um, are you, you know, so distracted with you know, how you look or, or whatever, how you feel that you can't perform at work. Mm -hmm. Do you not want your significant other to see you naked? Mm -hmm. Like, do, like, are you so insecure with how you look that this is affecting all these other functions? Like, that's totally different <laughs> than just like checking yourself out after the gym and being like, hey, like, I look right. good. Like, that's so different. Yeah. Um, and sometimes people take it to, so extreme. They're like, oh my God, anybody who cares about this. Like, you're just such a narcissist. Yeah. You're like, no, it's I think some true. people want to judge it. They don't like it. It's not because they don't life. want to right. put in that work. To They're not like putting that. in the work. And I can, <laughs> okay. I can tell you it is work. Like there's no two ways around it to get those results. You need to do the work. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so sometimes that's jealousy and projection of other people. Correct. But other times it really is like you, this has gotten out of hand mm -hmm. for you personally. Yeah. So just a couple other specifiers for the diagnosis. Um, with muscle dysmorphia, the individual is preoccupied with the idea that his or her body build is too small or insufficiently muscular. So sometimes you see people who are like, they view themselves as just really, really skinny and I'm not muscular enough. And so that's the problem. And so sometimes they can get into you know, a sport like bodybuilding to overcompensate for something like that. Whereas the root cause was there's nothing wrong with bettering yourself, but there is something wrong with hating yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, or doing it out of hatred and not out of the desire to grow. Right. Yes. Like you are choosing to do something because you're like, I hate how I look, so I need to do this. And it becomes this very negative thing that you're focused on and it's all very external versus if you're like no i want to look this way mm -hmm. and i want to use these experiences to grow as a person and also have bigger biceps cool right like, that's very different yeah. but it's it's really hard to tell the difference from the outside mm -hmm. <laughs> it's only once you get to actually know somebody like what's going on internally yeah and can they be honest with themselves uh, let alone things, with other yeah. people for their <laughs> motivation yeah you know um some of the other things is we want to indicate the degree of insight regarding that person's um, body dysmorphic type of beliefs. Like, is this, I'm ugly versus like, I'm deformed kind of a thing. There's a very different spectrum um, of those things. And so we're kind of looking at what level of insight this person has. Like, you know, if you were to come to me and be like, Rick, I'm, I'm physically deformed. I'd be like, Lauren, you're crazy. Like you might not like a particular aspect of yourself but you're not physically deformed. So that's gonna give me a little bit more clue as to like which specifier, where we are on the spectrum of like severity and how we're gonna move forward with addressing and what we need to start addressing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I do wanna get into, and I have this little phrase written down. So when it comes to competing, right? I so said this is the hard part because a person is going to I would assume, and you correct me, you jump in when you feel like I'm <laughs> not speaking fact. But a person oh, you who's, know I will. I know. So I'm gonna, <laughs> whatever category you fall into on the spectrum of, of bodybuilding, you're basically going to be eating a certain amount of calories, a healthy amount of calories, I would assume, or even maybe a little bit more so that you can build muscle and, and do the things to the body that you need it to do, right? To be able to perform in the gym, like you need to be eating certain carbs and have fat in your body and all that kind of stuff. So you're eating 
what I would assume at least at some point is a healthy diet, even if it's on a slightly higher calorie, right? So you can be in the gym and build the muscle that you need to build. But then eventually the person's like, okay, I have a show coming up and however far off that show is, the person then starts to change their diet, right? We're going into like more of a caloric deficit at this point. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Check me out. I'm learning this lingo. And so, so proud. I know. So now the person start, starts to restrict their diet so that their body can shrink and so that they can go lean, right? So now we can see all of the muscle that they've been building. <clears throat> well, this is where now the person starts to fall into like kind of that trap where it's like, I might feel like shit because I've depleted my body of everything that it needs to function in a healthy way. But I love the way that I look. And more importantly, I love the way that I, like my body feels, right? Like there's it's probably something very intoxicating about like just looking down and seeing your abs just ripped and like having, you know, feeling the tension in your body. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that all of that is, is, I've never been there, so I can only assume. I'm assuming that a lot of people fall in love with that part of it. Yes. Um, who said this? I can't remember, but there's, it was like some model. It was like, nothing tastes as good as skinny feels for this forever. <laughs> I've heard that. Yeah, yeah. I've used that. Um, <laughs> to shame the people. Um, <laughs> But that has always rang true in the sense of like, no, that really is, there is a feeling that you get, like that physical feeling of being that lean, mm -hmm. and like what that feels like, that I often find that people are chasing that feeling. Because like you said, everything is just so, and this is kind of at the tail end of the prep. I mean, there's different ends of, there's different parts of prep, but I'm talking when we're, you know, super lean, and especially like that that very end where like maybe you're lean and now you kind of start to fill out. So it's like this magic period, which mm -hmm. is really what like like peaking is for, right? You're, you're gonna get really, really lean and then you're going to peak, presumably over three to 10 days, to look your absolute best on one day. Mm -hmm. And then you've, so you've dieted for six months, you're at like 10% body fat. You know, if you're a female, if you're a male, it's a lot lower and you know, obviously differences, but you get it. you're very lean. So you, you look like trash pretty much every other day, but then as you start to pull back on your training and pull back on your cardio, you feel a little better. You start to get some more carbs, you get a little more salt, you get this tan, you're fucking pumped up, you got a face full of makeup where you normally look like the fucking Grim Reaper walking around. You're like, holy shit, this is amazing. Like, I feel amazing. Yeah. And it's like, of course you do. You are literally, presumably, hopefully peaked properly, for this one day, for these few hours. Mm -hmm. And everything has come together perfectly. Last time I checked, three weeks ago, you were not looking like this. You weren't feeling like this, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? But what we do is we hold on to that. Yeah. And that is what we end up chasing. And that is what is not just unrealistic, like we can talk about unrealistic body fat levels all day long, right? But what is really unrealistic is how you feel and look on show day and that is what people are chasing. And mm -hmm. that is what is so unrealistic. Because listen, if you are if you are viewing your body as what it should look like, it should look like how I've peaked all the time, mm -hmm. you're literally always setting yourself up for disappointment. Yeah. You are always going to be disappointed with your physique if that is what you are expecting to look and feel like. Right. Are there people who walk around with seemingly perfect bodies, right? Perfect is in big air quotes, right? Because everybody has a def different definition mm -hmm. of a perfect body. But we all know people who just walk around, they're muscular, they're lean, mm -hmm. they're fucking mobile. Like, they just got everything going on. You're like, how are you, like, athletic, put together, all these different things? Like, you look good, like, holy shit. Mm -hmm. Those are a small percentage of people. And those people are not... I hate to say this, it's like you're not gifted with that because you're not, you know what I mean? But like some people are just genetically predisposed mm -hmm. to be top level athletes with top level physiques and other people are not. Mm -hmm. And that's not a knock on anybody who's not. And that's not a knock on anybody who is, right? Like I'm not saying like, oh yeah, you just wake up and you look like this. No, 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 no. Fully understanding that this took years and years of work, but you had not only the work ethic and the dedication and the years but also the genetic predisposition mm -hmm. to be here. And there are just certain things that you're never, some people are gonna have that other people are never gonna have. Right. Like, it's just the reality, especially mm -hmm. when we're talking about a physique sport. So some people have just different muscle insertions. Some people have different heights. Mm -hmm. Some people have a different look. Some people have different rib cage structure, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, literally like, 
everything is going to come down to that starting place and you can make a fuckload of changes to your body but there is also the realistic aspect of mm -hmm. it you know what i mean right and it's like if you are not only expecting yourself to look a certain way all the time but you're expecting to look like somebody else right you are always again going to be setting well, yourself up for this this failure and disappointment and this like i'm not good enough because you're not going to be like that person right right i can look i know people who have 20 inch waist i gotta remove six ribs to have that <laughs> like like literally like that like no matter what i ever did to my body that would not be what i look like mm -hmm. and would i love to have a 20 inch waist would that be like rad yeah but I'm not going to. Do you know what I mean? Just like I'm 5'7", and there are some people who are five feet tall who would like to be taller, mm -hmm. and they're never going to be taller. Right. So it's like, why am I going to sit around and wish that I had something that I'm never going to have that's not even within the realm of my possibility? There are certain things that are within the realm of possibility, and I think distinguishing those things is what will allow people to mm -hmm. work through any kind of these like body dysmorphia tendencies I have, competitors or not. Because there are certain things that you can mm -hmm. change, you know what I mean? Like, hey, you don't like your nose? Get a fucking nose job. Mm -hmm. Get some filler. Like, you can do it. Mm -hmm. But I want to have something that, like, there's certain things that are not possible to mm -hmm. change. Um, and I think that, you know, part of what we talk about a lot is, like, actually focusing on, like, what you can, you know, focus on, mm -hmm. what you can change, what you can control. Um, and I think when people hear that sometimes they're like, oh, don't be negative. And it's like, it's not, it's not negative. Like, yes, you can do what you set your mind to. Mm -hmm. But when you set your mind to that, you also have to be, if you're just chasing something that's never going to be there, like you're just chasing for the sake of chasing. Right. You're never going to reach that destination. Does that make sense? It does. And so... But do you think that, I think that's why people get stuck in these patterns because they keep chasing like, oh, well, if I just do this more, or whatever, that I'm gonna get that result. And mm -hmm. I don't know, I feel like there's a lot of reasons why people Well, there, there are, and in and, and a lot of sports, you know, we're, you know, wrestling, jujitsu, MMA, like there's a lot of things where people will have to cut dramatic amounts of body weight or, you know, mass to get to a certain weight or look a certain way. It's usually only held for like a fraction of a time. Like those guys, oh. like on the UFC, when they're jumping on the scale and they're weighing in at 170, yeah. <laughs> right? When they go to fight the very next day, 24 hours later, they're 190, 195 because they rehydrated. And they need to be. Right. So they but. literally are that weight, like for, you know, three, four hours out of the year mm -hmm. because they're backstage sweating it off. Yeah. So I, I think for me, one of the things that, number one is, what is your motivation for competing? first of all. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to address that as a really big component with this. Like, is your idea of competing, is it to be the best? Is it because you enjoy competing and you enjoy going against other people and the excitement of winning and being a champion is what your motivation is, right? Those are typical reasons for any competition. That's really what it, most competitions about. Like, I want to be the best basketball player. I want to be a Super Bowl champion. I want to be the best jujitsu athlete, whatever it is. Right? It's just about me being the best at that sport or the other individual. However, with this particular sport, and as I said before, it is different from other ones. Are you competing because you want to feel better about yourself? Are you competing because this is going to make you more important or relevant as an individual? Right? Is the idea, and this is also a kind of a parallel concept, what is your definition and idea of what beautiful is? Because if it is only that stage lean competitor, that's the only version of me that's beautiful and important, then we're gonna have problems because you can't exist or live, you're going to die if you keep or maintain that level of leanness. Like all kinds of bad things are gonna start happening to your body physically and mentally let alone the rest of your life. You won't be able to function at work. You won't have relationships that are worthwhile. Like everything is going to collapse around you. And so for me, one of the things that I'm, that I notice within some of the competitors is what is your definition of beautiful and beautiful beauty within yourself? And so maybe part of this is we're going to have to start to restructure and get an idea of reshaping what pretty and beautiful is to you on a healthier space and not it can't just be the only time i'm happy the only time i'm pretty or beautiful 
or attractive is when I'm stage lean. If that's if that's the only space that it can exist, you said it yourself, like you're doing all these things to get to a space where for a few hours on one day, that's all that you are. And then here's the worst part. There's a thousand pictures that are taken of you that day and probably leading up to it where you're like super lean and you're shredded and people are posting those. Totally get it, show your hard work off. But then that becomes the expectation, right? When I'm posting pictures of me when I haven't competed for a year, right and i look completely different and i can still compare myself to my old self right you fall into this like vicious cycle where it's like well that was me at my best it's like your best this is you when you're pretty like and it's this complete devaluation of who you are when you're normally walking around and so that's why i'm saying what's your motivation for getting into competing you know are these thoughts or these ideas or these concepts and these beliefs about yourself existing and competition becomes a way of almost masking them and working to a space that you can't maintain that is unobtainable on a long-term scale and it's become the the criteria that you determine your self-worth and value off of that's when it becomes dangerous and so people who are struggling with body dysmorphia right but still actively competing like it's kind of like asking well how do i pet a rattlesnake safely i don't know if you can right so part of me is like, well, how do I address my body dysmorphia but still compete in bodybuilding? Like, that's asking a lot because you're still giving into the sickness, right? It's, it's like somebody saying to me, Rick, well, how do I get better with my addiction from alcohol by smoking weed? Uh, you know, like, or, oh, or drinking some people can stuff. Have, some people yeah. can have one well, drink, why the thing, can't yeah. I? <laughs> Don't drink for seven days and then, you know, every eighth day you get to go out and, and drink your ass off. What's that thing that they call a uh, Hollywood sober? Um, I don't have you ever heard, heard of that? that phrase. I, I think it's like it's something like that to where people who like used to be on like hard drugs like no, no I just smoke weed now yeah, yeah. and like do what and you're like <laughs> I have nothing against weed or any drugs but the whole idea of that is like kind of hilarious you know yeah. you're like wait like just say that you're not like yeah I'm not doing coke anymore I'm just drinking yeah you're like right. oh oh okay. well the, the, they'll use the inverse <laughs> of that as well like when I work with substance abuse people guy will be like dude I just smoke weed I don't do coke and then the guy will be like. I do coke, but I don't do heroin. Yeah. Well, I do heroin, but I don't do meth. Yeah. Like, it's just like, what the it's fuck, you guys? It's always justified. Yeah, there's just this, these varying levels of like, well, I have to make what I'm doing less like, dangerous. The, 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 the skit you sent me. Um, the, the comedy skit. Oh, alcoholism is the best disease. Um, and, oh my God, who was the guy's name? Norm MacDonald. Holy shit. So you just like randomly sent this to me, and I was dying where they were talking about like, in AA, like, you don't, you don't share... Your, your name. name, but you're like, but I like, to, you know, like, you know, I all the horrible things. Yeah, I killed somebody for name. like this bottle of whiskey or whatever. But you're not gonna know my last name. <laughs> <laughs> like, even though you could like clearly identify these people, it was just a really hilarious skit to like obviously make light of something that's yeah. very yeah. important. But it if was, you want to hear it, find Norm Macdonald, <laughs> and I think it's called the best. The best disease. disease. Yeah. Oh my god, um, I was dying. So, um, but no, like, so it's it's yeah how do you do that and i would say that if you really are you know we were kind of talking about this a little bit earlier with completely different stuff but until you have met enough like pain and resistance in your life to certain areas you're probably not going to be ready to change mm -hmm. right so i think a lot of times people who are maybe in the like depths of their body dysmorphia are like well i can do both like it's not that bad it's not mm -hmm. that bad but they haven't gotten to a place where it's necessarily affecting them enough right to where they recognize like maybe I really can't do both of these things simultaneously right. and sometimes that's a really like you want to help people before they get there mm -hmm. right because you don't want to see anybody that you know personally or you care about to reach a place where they're not able to function at work and their hormones are shit and they've pushed away everybody and all their relationships and all these things but sometimes people are not like you they the individual has to want to make that change and mm -hmm. If they, you can say, so like they're fucking blue in the face, like you have, you know, have body dysmorphia, you have these things we need to work through. But if they're like, yeah, yeah I know, but I want to compete again. Right. If I get lean, if I get lean one more time, it'll fix it because I just, I'm just not happy with what I look like right now. Yeah. And I, and, and I get the, yeah. I get the paradox that this puts people in because they really want to compete and they found that like, look, I'm, I'm good at this. I like it. Yeah. So they My may life, actually. Do you hear this? You I'm want. better when I'm competing. Do you hear that? <laughs> That's kind of like saying, uh, uh, what's my favorite phrase? People are like, oh, I drive better drunk. 
I hear that all the time. I'm yeah. Like, oh no, when I'm drunk, I drive so much better. Who the fuck said? Hey, if you say that, check your shit. Um, you don't. I promise you don't. No, but there's some people, and I understand what they're saying. When you are competing, you typically put blinders on and mm-hmm. things that are not important in your life and you're able to like really prioritize your time and there's all these really positive benefits that come along with competing so you think that it's the competing that makes you better and it's mm-hmm. like no 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 it's you just actually having a discipline very direct and goal focus. and focus and discipline to work towards something it doesn't have to be this bodybuilding happens to just strip all that away because you really have no other choice yeah. and you're really focused on like almost at some point like survival like I gotta get all this shit done mm-hmm. and my bodybuilding stuff well there's no room for extraneous things right. um, and I'm all about having very direct focus and being very deliberate in like what we're doing but if you have those blinders and everything else is falling to the wayside at some point those blinders are going to come mm-hmm. off and you're going to be left with a very very sad and lonely life you with know, nothing to really show for it what I think people do to rationalize it is this I think sometimes people are like okay I know that this is an issue that I have I know that I struggle with it And so they might take small breaks from competing. But what I think they do is they kind of rationalize it in their mind and they'll say like, okay, I know that these things are gonna happen. So it's kind of like, let's just say it's like a broken arm, like body dysmorphia is like having a broken arm. And so they're gonna be like, okay, I know breaking my arm hurts. I know it's gonna take a few weeks to heal or a few months, but I'm gonna go do it anyway. And so they prepare for the show, they break their arm, And then they're stuck with the results recommend. where it's like in a cast, it's just six weeks, they've got to rehab it and all that kind of stuff. But then eventually what happens, the arm heals, which is like on a long enough timeline, like they don't feel as depressed, they're not quite as anxious. And so like balance kind of restores. And then the person just kind of accepts this level of pain in their life and they're saying like, okay, in order to compete, this is something I have to accept, mm-hmm. right? And then they start the process again, they break their arm and they move, that's just kind of like rinse, wash and repeat. And so I think when you're, when you start to address, and so when we start to get more into treatment right now, um, like what are some of the best ways to do this? Well, number one, I would say. Would you say that you do have to stop competing if you really are finding I would say, affecting your life? Okay, so let's say I have like a mid twenties bodybuilder who's like, look, I still feel like I have a few years or some really good competitions ahead of me and this isn't something that I want to quit. Then I guess like, cause it, again, this isn't the ideal circumstances. Cause I would say like bodybuilding competing breeds into the disorder, right? You're literally putting everything back into what the disorder is in order to compete in bodybuilding. But, so I get what the person's saying. And so I would preface it by saying like, ideally I don't want you competing because in order for us to really address this, we need to establish a new idea of health and beauty, right? Of like, what is healthy? what is pretty and live in that space because that's the space we're going to be living in but to answer that question because i get that it's not a perfect world people are going to go do it i would say all right we need to at least commit to a significant break from competing to the point where we can start to address what the underlying core beliefs are what the underlying thoughts are the process for when those thoughts start to occur all of those kinds of things and get you to a space where mentally you're really healthy and love who you are before you're competing. And then hopefully get to that space where now we're getting back into the competition for the right reasons instead of, you know, because this is the only way I feel good about myself. This is the only way I seek validation. This is the only way people reassure me that I'm doing the right thing. This is the only thing that I'm good at, whatever that is. Like, I don't want those to be the motivating factors for somebody competing. As much as it would be like, well, I'm good at this. I want to be the best. Like I'm, I can beat, you know, the rep, like I want to be the champion, that kind of thing. It's not ideal, but that would be the process. And I would say like, I guess what's more important to you, Mm -hmm. right? Is your own mental health more of a priority for you than winning that trophy or the plaque or the medal or whatever it is? Because and this goes back to one of our old podcasts. I don't remember what it was. It's like, what is your life going to be like outside of this, right? When bodybuilding ends, what's your life going to be like? And what are you doing now that could alter or change the outcome of that? What are you doing to your hormones? What are you doing to your body? What substances are you taking to improve that could have an impact on your liver or your kidneys or your heart? You know what I mean? And this is men and women. Like we've seen you've seen, I'm sure even more than I have, significant deaths 
in the bodybuilding industry is the use of, you know, as a problem with steroids and some of the other things that people are taking to get to the space where they're either that lean or they're building more muscle or whatever it is. So for me, that's kind of where, how I would approach it. I would want that person to commit to a significant break from competing and say, look, we've got to readdress our core beliefs about ourselves, what we're thinking, what we're feeling, what our idea of beauty and health is and feel good in that space and know that like when I'm fully fed at a good calorie, like that I can look in the mirror and be happy with what I see, right? That I don't feel the need to excessively check it, that I'm not seeking reassurance, that I don't need to compare myself to other people. That would be the space that I would do it. Treatment models that are highly effective with body dysmorphia are generally cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, again, it's addressing core beliefs, it's addressing perceptions of self and the body. Um, that's kind of the fundamental treatment aspect that most people will go through. There are other ancillary treatments that feed into that. Like, this is one of the parts as a clinician where it's like, oh, well, we know CBT is like, it fits the majority of what this disorder is and this is the best method for it, but that doesn't mean we can't draw from other things to enhance it. Because CBT is not always going to be the end all, be all for a lot of people. And it's not just also, it's not just like changing your your thoughts into like, okay, well I was thinking that I'm ugly and now I've got to think that I'm pretty. It's more than that. It's identifying like when the thoughts are starting to occur, what your coping mechanisms are for that. Learning how to steer in the opposite direction and be comfortable with those things. That's the hard part. That's the part where that's what the work is. And unfortunately, like you have your therapist for an hour or two a week but the rest of your life is you. And so the objective is really to start to build the resiliency within you to be like, okay, I can manage these situations. And for some people like body dysmorphia looks more like social anxiety, right? They can be like, I don't want to go out in public because the perception of what other people are thinking of them. And so it's like, so they start to avoid certain things. They create safety bubbles around them all the time. And so the idea becomes, how do I identify what their safety and coping mechanisms are? And are they really healthy because they're keeping them safe from danger or the perception of danger? And then readjusting that to getting them to confront what their coping mechanisms have been and moving in kind of that, not necessarily opposite direction, but in the direction of health. Like to move in the space that requires them to exist without impacting their function. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that there, you know, a lot of times when we talk about this stuff, I think a lot of people immediately are like, okay, so competing is going to give me body dysmorphia or competing is bad. No. Absolutely not what we're saying no. at all. Some and people are going to be like, I can do this, no problem. I can shrink my body and I can come back and they don't have an issue with it. Good for them. And there are people who, a lot of people who are drawn to this sport are people who are typically, you know, do well with extremes because mm -hmm. it's, it's an extreme thing. Um, it's going to draw a lot of people who've had obsessive tendencies or have had eating disorders previously and they're able to overcome those things with competing, right, by having this focus that allows them to enhance other areas of their life and allows them to stay on track because of this. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of really good benefits to competing and if you talk to competitors who are doing this for those kind of intrinsic reasons, you know, every time they're getting on stage, it's not because, oh, I hate myself and how I look right now. It's because I want to improve from last time mm -hmm. and I want to experience this growth. And every time that I compete, I learn something new about myself. Mm -hmm. And there are certainly really, really positive things that can come out of competing Absolutely. like those. And some of the people that I know who are able to compete for years and years and years are like, oh my gosh, how do they have these you know, careers like this? And it's because that's how they're thinking, right? It is all intrinsically based. Of course, they are seeking to win. Nobody's going to get on stage to be like, hope I get last place. <laughs> that would be like, you're, you're not going to make it, FYI. You have to be training right. with that intent and that will to win. However, it's recognizing that your individual self-worth is not determined by that placing. Right. And that is so hard to tease out. So I would say that for people who are getting into this, the, and you're never really going to know how you're going to respond to something until you're in that situation. And that's one of the hardest things, right? It's like, mm -hmm. we can try and prep people for this or say this, or do, you never really know how you're going to respond. Like you might get there and you might think that I'm going to be a total basket case and you're totally put together. Mm -hmm. Other times you think like, no, I'm mentally resilient. I'm strong. And you just fucking fall apart. And sometimes that happens, right? But 
what the point of this is is for people to recognize if you haven't started yet if you're if you're interested in this right probably doing some of this like inner work to realize okay why am i doing this mm -hmm. am i in a resilient enough place to look at this as like an inward mm -hmm. thing instead of like just looking for external validation validation and like these values and also if you are in in this right and you're recognizing okay i'm dealing with all of these issues okay now what do i do to get out of it right you know can i compete and not experience this and it is possible mm -hmm. but when you're in the middle of it it's probably going to be really hard to do so and you're probably going to have to take a step back right. and that step back might be three months six months five years i don't know it's yeah. going to be different for every single person so there's really no right way to approach it but it is taking a step back and recognizing man okay like this this might be me this might be why i'm doing these things um <clears throat> and listen i've been stage lean enough times to know that Again, when you're there, you're not always making the most clear decisions, mm -hmm. right? And I've worked with enough people who that's the same thing. Like you're just maybe not your most clear headed. So the best strategy that I can suggest, and I'm sure that you would suggest as well, is before you even start to be in this place where you are like 100% locked in. And we talk a lot on this podcast and in all of our content about having a really great relationship with food. Mm -hmm. Because that relationship with food is going to dwindle as you prep. I don't care who you are, <laughs> what methods you're employing, your relationship with food is going to be challenged as you are getting stage lean. That mm -hmm. is the reality. But if we are starting at 100% and we get down to about 70, that is a lot fucking better than starting at like 50 and right. getting to zero. Mm -hmm. So the same thing goes with body image and how we view ourselves. If we are coming at it in a place that is really, really solid with all these intrinsic values, doesn't mean that by the end of prep, we're gonna feel that great. You're probably not. Like the reality is you're probably not gonna feel that great. And you're going to be doing, engaging in some of these behaviors more. And you maybe are going to be putting yourself forth a little bit into this external validation. That's normal. But to completely turn your life upside down over it and to be like so deep in, into it, that's what we want to avoid. Right. So I think that it's about, if, if you can take one thing away from this, it would be to, if you are going to engage in a prep, whether you're a first time competitor or you are a you know seasoned competitor who's just been struggling with this, is to get to a place where you are 100% confident in your skills, in yourself, in your self-worth mm -hmm. before you engage in another prep. What do you think that's a fair Yeah, process? I mean, that's I, I want you to be in the healthiest possible space before you start down the path of something that can absolutely start to create mental anguish in your life. Um, and if you can't be honest with yourself about that part, you shouldn't be competing. Because um, you're gonna, whatever is happening inside you is, is going to amplify. Everything is amplified when yeah. you compete. And yeah. again, it's, it's mostly due to the physiological nature of what we're mm -hmm. doing when we're competing. And <clears throat> for some people, it is it affects them less than others, right? And right. I'll always say this, there are some people, not, people who are naturally leaner typically do not experience like they can they can get a little bit leaner mm -hmm. without as many swings you know because sure. they may be losing 10 pounds uh, it's people, just like anything right? right some people pick up some people are faster than some people, people are born into money some people aren't and yeah. they struggle with the rest of their life some there's people certain, are athletic some people yeah. aren't right like like some people are flexible other people aren't like there's just different things that like so for some people who are, are naturally leaner coming into this they're able to navigate this so if you're listening and that's you congratulations like right. i'm really happy for you and that is awesome and you like will be able to compete more frequently without some of these maybe some of these physiological kickbacks that we mm -hmm. talk about but for the majority of people, you're going to have a lot of physiological mm -hmm. side effects yep. and metabolic adaptations with dieting, which are all totally normal, but those are also going to affect your psychology. Yeah. And those are the things that we have to balance. And not saying that if you're naturally lean, you're not gonna deal with psychological issues, of course not. But what I'm just saying is that you're not gonna be exacerbated mm -hmm. by all of these you know, huge swings from your settling point. So yeah. that's not the point of this podcast, but those two things are very tied into each other. Mm -hmm. Um, so being in a mental state where you're able to enter this and execute this, that is just more mentally sound, I think is going to be Yeah, and understand that antidote. even though we can get you to a space that's mentally sound and healthy and wonderful, you're now choosing, consciously choosing, to go into a space that can, that can hurt you and deteriorate you and bring you back to the space that you were in. Like that's a reality that you have to accept. Mm -hmm. like, 
just like any other competition, like you have to accept the fact that injury is a part of it. Mm -hmm. And this is a big injury that comes with that sport. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other stuff that, you know, some people are like, well, I don't know if I fit criteria for body dysmorphia. It can manifest in other ways. And this is kind of the last note that I would make on the topic would be people with body dysmorphia might also think that they have anxiety issues, which oftentimes they do. It can present as social anxiety. It can depend or excuse me, present as like depressive disorders. Um, you can present with obsessive compulsive disorders. Um, and obviously drugs and alcohol substance abuse is also a big part of this. And I don't just mean like alcohol. I mean, people are going to start taking extreme amounts of gear, or testosterone, whatever it is, so that they can change the physical nature of their body to be more appealing to the way that they want. And so these things get dangerous, you know, um, and they can also manifest in other ways. People are like, well, I don't think I have body dysmorphia, but I do know that I struggle with depression. And sometimes if the therapist isn't really trained or looking for this, a lot of times they will miss. This is not a common thing for most therapists to see. You start working with a, more of a specific clientele where it's a little bit more prevalent. It's like, okay, I'm seeing this more and more. So now my, like, I'm a little bit more attuned to it. But like, if you're going into somebody who doesn't like have clients or experiences in these areas, like they might just diagnose it as depression. They might look at it and say, well, it's anxiety and they'll spend a lot of time working through old trauma, right? Going through your past, digging through your history. And it's kind of like, okay, no, this person needs a little bit more in the moment stuff to manage the anxiety, understand the core beliefs where they're struggling with their dysmorphia. Um, so make sure that you're, if you are seeking help with this, that you guys are talking about the anxiety, the belief systems, the thoughts, the coping mechanisms, and challenging that, not just changing the way you think, but challenging yourself in those ways to break down what your old coping mechanisms were. And then understand that there's no way around competing that is going to bring this part out, right? It's just a nature, it's the, it's the aspect of the sport. And so you have to accept that and maybe decide like, okay, if I'm only going to do this, I need to select one or two shows to do my very best in and then leave it alone at that. Um, and not do like, I don't know, what's a crazy amount of shows for somebody to do in one year. I mean, it, it just depends, but I would say not really having a season and just kind of haphazardly doing shows and saying, you know, I'll just jump into another one. Let me just do another one. I can yeah. be ready in a few weeks. I'll, I'll just do another one. Yeah, that seems dangerous to me. Yeah, it, it, it fuels that nature of like, well, if I just do it one more time, I'll get better. Mm -hmm. And to some degree, you could be right, right? Mm -hmm. You could get better. Yeah. Um, but if the answer for everything, really where I see the biggest issue with this, um, at least in my experience, is when people start to feel uncomfortable with their body in some way and they want to dive right back into a show mm -hmm. because they're uncomfortable with their body and some maybe other choices in their life and other things that are happening and they think that competing is going to be the solution to that and that is where it becomes a problem that right. then it is no longer I'm doing this to be competitive mm -hmm. I'm doing this because I'm excited I've set aside the time to do this this is everything else in my life is a shit storm let me do this um, and I'll be honest there are some times where I coach people where this is the only anchor that they have in their life mm -hmm. and that is also okay Right? There's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes shit is just hitting the fan and we need something to anchor ourselves. Mm -hmm. And this consistency and discipline and all of this is, is, is great for that. Yeah. But Absolutely. it's also you going into the show knowing I'm doing this again to be competitive, to be my best. Not because mm -hmm. I hate myself and I hate my life, so I'm gonna compete. It's like, hey, I just need something to kind of anchor me and I have all these right intentions for competing. Mm -hmm. That is very different. So there's these very, very fine lines and distinctions here um, that a lot of people kind of miss. But that is where, as a coach, you need to be able to pick up on the language that someone is using. Right. So you're using really negative language about themselves and how they're feeling and they're, mm -hmm. and they're saying that this external thing is going to change that. That is when it is a problem. Not, hey, there's all these crazy things happening in my mm -hmm. life. I would really like an anchor and I would, I've been wanting to get back into prep because we've made some changes and I want to be competitive. Mm -hmm. Very different. Looks similar, yeah. but it's very different. On the in the internal perspective and how the person is going to view their results because that second person is not going to be happy with the results no matter what well and then the results are short-lived even if you win right what happens then yeah that, I, was <laughs> I, mean, literally, like, I was literally telling a client this the other day I said it, it, it ends and you have to repeat the cycle in order to receive the validation again and because then, even if you win the biggest show you could win the Olympia you don't think that those people now still have 
They don't win and go, oh, okay, cool. No, they win and go, oh, now I have to maintain this. <laughs> well, I've, I've had that conversation with people before where they're, they're amateurs and they're like, I need to do one more show to get my pro card. And once, and I'm like, and what happens when you get the pro card? You're just gonna stop. You're not gonna want to compete against the other pros, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, yeah. No, of course not. So like, there's all these these traps that people just you know kind of set for themselves, and we rationalize our way into these things, and it becomes difficult for them to get themselves out of it. Um, but hopefully this this helped. Um, if you guys like the podcast, please make sure when. Uh, when Lauren posts it, you put a bunch of fire emojis on it. <laughs> <laughs> the only way to comment now is to only put fire emojis on every single one of my posts. That way I know that you're actually listening to the podcast. So please, please do that. I will be so happy. My engagement will go through the roof. You, I will be you so a, validated. You had a look on your face like, is Rick really taking my outro from me? <laughs> I really was like, I know you hate my intros and my outros. So I was like, this motherfucker is just going for it. But anyways, if fire, you, <laughs> I was ready for a fire outro, but then you just stop. So, you know, what? if you guys are interested in working with Rick, I will put his contact in the show notes below. He's a real shithead, but he's also a therapist. <laughs> and if you like this week's episode, True story. please share. It's the best way that you can support our show. Um, and I really think this will be valuable for so many people. So check out our coaching services, courses, courses we offer and additional content we put out. Visit our website teamlogofit.com and follow us on Instagram at teamlogofit. We will talk to you guys next week.